Good afternoon. Welcome to the session, PT and RT, palliative care. The team has worked diligently the past six months to bring you information and support for this arena of CF care. Jackie Vicencio and I are your moderators. We appreciate your attention and we'll have a question and answer five minute session after each speaker. Please find the session in your app and submit your questions. I will try to repeat each question so all can hear. These sessions are timed at 20 minutes, each followed by a question and answer time, and then we move on to the next slide. If your question is not answered, please email the speaker or see us afterwards. Let's begin. Our first speaker is Dr. Tara Bartow, Director of Baylor Clinic, Adult CF Center from Houston, Texas. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Bartow is board certified in internal medicine, pediatrics, pulmonary disease, and critical care medicine. Her clinical interests include cystic fibrosis, CF research, transition, and advanced lung disease. She also works in Pavilion for Women in Houston with ventilated pregnancies and aiming for the best outcome for mother and child. Again, please welcome Dr. Tara Bartow. Thanks, Bethann. I really appreciate this. Um, so I, uh, I have to thank the moderators for asking me to speak on this topic because um, I thought that I did a pretty good job with this topic, and after having done the literature review and, and putting this together, I realize uh, how much we all probably have to learn. Um, so let's get started. So my disclosures, uh, I will confess that the only disclosure I do not have up here is that I'm an Astros fan. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let that cloud your judgment. All right, uh, today we're gonna talk about um, just a couple of different aspects related to palliative care. Uh, I would like to define palliative care, both um, globally as well as within the CF community, go over some goals that palliative care puts forth, as well as some of barriers to achieving those goals. And then finally, we wanna talk about how we assess the needs of palliative care in specific populations. Uh, and briefly go over the new CF Foundation consensus guidelines on palliative care. So defining palliative care, and I think this is probably the most important point of my talk. You'll hear, hear me refer to it a couple of times throughout. Um, so palliative care is the specialized medical care for those patients with serious illnesses. It's a comprehensive approach to reduce symptoms and improve quality of life. In addition, there's ongoing efforts to cure and reduce the progression of their disease. Now this is in stark contrast to hospice care, even though these two terms are often used synonymously, um, hospice care is the specialized care of those with serious illness. It's a comprehensive approach to reduce symptoms and improve quality of life. But these patients elect to forego life-sustaining treatments and it's typically initiated in the last six months of life. So when uh, the CF Foundation sat down to start talking about palliative care, they felt the very first thing they needed to do was create a definition for palliative care within CF. So they convened 36 individuals, uh, including people with CF, caregivers, care team members, as well as palliative care specialists. Um, they reviewed 22 different attributes that they thought were pertinent to the definition of, of uh, palliative care, uh, including things like Palliative care provides relief of pain. Palliative care is unique to each patient. Palliative care makes use of available community resources. And they voted on those and then came up with the wording to create the definition. And the final definition the CF Foundation put forward was palliative care focus on, focuses on reducing physical and emotional symptoms and improving quality of life for people with CF throughout their lives. Palliative care occurs alongside usual treatments and is individualized according to the unique goals, hopes, and values of each person with CF. Now, when I read this definition, there were three points that really kind of stuck out to me. First was throughout their lifespan. 
So to me, that means that this is going to be delivered throughout the course, beginning at diagnosis. Um, and then the intensity of palliative care services uh, can vary throughout the course of their disease, from just from simply helping someone reduce their cough all the way through to end of life advanced care planning. Um, this is also alongside their usual treatments. And this is what makes our teams uh, uniquely qualified to be able to help with primary palliative care. We have continuous monitoring of these patients. We develop strong relationships with these patients, and um, which uh, puts us in a perfect position to be able to help these patients. And then individualized. Um, we can assess multiple areas of need and tailor to the individual of our patients. So I use the term primary palliative care. Um, there's, a, there's two different models of care, primary and specialized. Primary is delivered by any care provider, so that could be a primary care provider or a CF care team member. And it's basic palliative care needs, such as physical and psychological symptom relief, communication and education about the disease, and prognostication, uh, caregiver assessment and support, as well as care coordination. If these uh, aspects go a little bit further and become a little bit more complex, specialized palliative care uh, individuals, um, those physicians that are specifically trained in palliative care, um, they can have, they have expert management in complex or intractable distress, advanced care planning, uh, addressing concerns about misalignment of care, which means if there are differences of opinions between patients and, and family members as to how someone should be treated. And then explore grief and bereavement. <clears throat> so that's a pretty comprehensive uh, review of, the, of what palliative care, the def definition of it. And then whenever we start talking about the goals of palliative care, in a global sense, that's going to be relief of suffering and improved quality of life. So when we talk about relief of suffering, that's going to be symptom management, not just physical, but also emotional. Patients, as we know, have incredible fatigue, lots of pain reported in CF, shortness of breath, as well as emotional. So they, there's very high rates of anxiety and depression, um, which has been reviewed already by the foundation. There can be functional impairment, meaning patients are focused on their treatments. They have significant treatment burden, but they're unable to maintain their, their livelihood and their jobs, as well as their, their health care. There's social isolation, which a lot of us uh, probably got a little bit of experience with recently with coughing in public. There's role limitations, treatment-related burdens, and existential distress. But there's also advanced care planning. So this is understanding patients' preferences for their medical care, setting goals, um, not just in um, work or personal life, but in their, in their health care, um, helping patients determine who's going to be their surrogate decision makers, as well as preparing advanced directives. And finally, there's caregiver support that is also included in palliative care. And this can be central throughout uh, the lifespan of a, of a patient. Um, roles change over time, and the degree and intensity of support of the caregiver can change. For example, um, parents of infants have significant uh, roles and significant um, burden. They, they take on almost all the burden of the treatment, whereas uh, as patients grow up and move out and either go to college or, or get a career, um, parents' roles change a little bit. Um, and then there's physical and emotional support that these caregivers provide. But in doing so, they themselves can be burnt out and need, need our support. So there was um, one study looking at actually asking patients what they need. Um, it was a mixed method study of 49 patients where they did qualitative interviews as well as questionnaires. And they identified three themes. The first is that patients wanted to be listened to feel heard, and be seen. So it's really important if patients are going to be vulnerable. And in talking about uh, disease progression and, and changes throughout life, it's a vulnerable position for, for anyone. Um, so the, in order for patients to be vulnerable, they have to trust you. And they want to be sure they're going to be listened to and heard and seen. 
Um, they also want to understand the context around CF and its trajectory. So they actually want to know what, what's to be expected from their disease, what's to be expected from their future. That way they can plan, they can prepare. And finally, they want information about solutions to practical circumstances that can cause stress. So they experience a lot of these situations where they can't, um, they don't feel that they have good solutions to or they can't um, navigate very easily. So they look to us to help them navigate how do they do insurance? How do they do their job? How do they do their treatments? How do they come to appointments um, and not have their job uh, or their boss mad at them? There's a lot of, uh, just as an example. So, um, so that kind of summarizes a little bit of the goals of palliative care as far as what we can provide and what patients need. There's actually quite a few barriers to palliative care. Um, a lot of that is just in, inherent in the disease itself. There's a lot of differences within the CF population. They're young age with advanced disease. Uh, so oftentimes we don't think about palliative care in a younger age group because our mindset is more on palliative care is synonymous with end of life and you don't want, you want to continue um, an atmosphere of hope and, and um, longevity with these young patients. Um, there's frequently challenges with prognostication with cystic fibrosis. Availability of lung transplant is actually a barrier in the sense that you don't think about how to prepare for what's going to come down the pike for these patients. Instead, you're thinking, well, they'll, once they get sick enough, they'll go to lung transplant. So it doesn't necessarily dawn on care providers to, to initiate palliative care discussions. And then with the advent of disease-modifying therapies and everybody being so excited and, and optimistic, um, a lot of people don't want, a lot of care providers don't want to um, change that or, or put up any sort of um, antithesis to that type of hope. Uh, so <clears throat> and a lot of this encompasses these false conceptions where um, palliative, palliative care means you need to make choices between um, transplant or compass comfort focused treatment as you move through your your disease course. It's often uh, looked upon as an option of last resort for those who are dying. Uh, it also, also carries along implications of a lack of hope. Um, and these misconceptions are often supported by the fact that care team members don't bring up palliative care discussions until we are moving towards the end of a disease course or there has been a significant decline in their health care, in a, in a patient's health care. So um, there was one study that looked at, um, it was a questionnaire asking care team members and adults and caregivers about different aspects of palliative care. And I thought there were a couple of points that were very interesting. So the first is that the, when they asked care team members about um, has palliative care been introduced to patients, 73% of the care team believed that that had, been, that had occurred, whereas in the same population, uh, adults with CF, only 26% had thought that palliative care services had been introduced and only 12% of caregivers. So clearly there is um, miscommunication uh, if care, care team members believe they're introducing palliative care services it's either not being heard or not being um, described appropriately. The other thing is that um, as far as care team concerns, uh, they said one third of care team members felt reluctant, felt that the person with cystic fibrosis was reluctant to discuss palliative care. Uh, so about 30, 35% of, of care team members believed that. But in reality, the, the questionnaire demonstrated that only 5% of people with CF and caregivers felt reluctant to discuss palliative care services. And when you actually talk to these patients um, and look at their willingness, um, they say that very few of them want to initiate the conversation, but more than 50% are willing to discuss. Um, and they comment that the future is easier 
to address when care team bring up the topic. So patients know that this is a progressive disease. They know that there's uh, differences in their future. They don't want to be the one to bring that up, but they, they do want to discuss it. Um, similar to the fact that care team members are oftentimes anxious to bring up these topics, um, but I think providing a framework around these types of conversations will make it easier for both care team members and, and people with CF and caregivers to be able to have these important discussions. So a couple of other barriers, a little bit more logistic, is that there is often a lack of access to outpatient palliative care resources, um, as well as a lack of palliative care training for team members. Um, along with this, there's also a lack of training for palliative care specialists in the unique aspects of cystic fibrosis care. Uh, there's often lack of time to address palliative care topics, and this was most felt by uh, caregivers. Um, and then there is a belief that palliative care is not appropriate for lung transplant candidates. Um, and this was identified most commonly in pediatric and transplant teens. And then uh, hospice care, which is a part of palliative care, um, can often be compromised due to cost of medications and the way hospice care is delivered traditionally on a per diem basis cannot afford a lot of the symptom reducing medications that cystic fibrosis patients require. So after we reviewed all these barriers, the next step would be looking at uh, assessing needs in uh, palliative care. Um, so there's a couple of different surveys that uh, have been looked at in uh, palliative care. So the first one is the Supportive Care Needs Survey 34. It's originally designed for cancer patients and validated in oncology and has five domains that are psychological, informational, physical care support, and sexuality, and it's on a Likert scale. It, um, it can be a little uh, daunting as far as filling it out um, and utilizing it um, in an in a appropriate manner in the sense that you don't want to do over, over question patients, um, but using it on a uh, certain time base that, that wouldn't be burdensome would be appropriate. There's Edmonton Symptoms Assessment System, the ESAS, which is nine, focuses on nine different symptoms, some of which are pain, fatigue, dyspnea, anxiety, and well-being. And then there's a Cystic Fibrosis Questionnaire Revised, the CFQR, which is validated in cystic fibrosis and has nine domains of health-related quality of life. So um, looking at two different papers, uh, assessing needs in palliative care, uh, Dellen et al. looked at um, or identified the top three uh, areas of need are emotional support, which was ranked number one by 38% of people with CF that they interviewed. Um, and some of the, one of the comments was coping with serious illness, uh, grief, and loss related to CF is an uh, area of need. Um, second would be advanced care planning. Uh, patients commented that they need to be led. Uh, they need support and guidance, and they won't be the ones to ask for it, which I think echoes some of the earlier uh, comments that we reviewed. And then thirdly is symptom management. But what's interesting about symptom management is that um, it's not so much the people with CF that commented on symptom management, but the care teams and the caregivers feel as though symptom management is, is very important in palliative care. And then <clears throat> another study uh, just a year later um, identified uh, the 10 most common needs in palliative care were all physical or psychological. So under physical, lack of energy and tiredness was identified by 65% of people with CF and feeling unwell often by 52% of patients. Psychological um, would be fears about my CF getting worse in the 50% of patients. They also identified that symptom burden was more, cor more strongly correlated with unmet needs than the actual FEV1. So the next step would be the CF Foundation guidelines. Um, we'll just quickly kind of review. We've gone over a lot of this information already. But these were published in 2020 uh, by a 22-member committee. 
that was broken up into three working groups. They looked at models of palliative care delivery, uh, palliative care skills and training, and screening and assessment of palliative needs. They came up with 11 recommendation statements, and they uh, determined a recommendation statement I priori with 80% consensus as the minimum threshold for approval. So when we look at primary palliative care recommendations, um, the first one is that CF care teams should deliver primary palliative care as part of their usual care throughout the lifespan. And these CF care teams should receive primary uh, palliative care training relevant to their discipline. And third, the CF and transplant team should engage people with CF and caregivers in goals of care discussions and advance care planning across the lifespan to align care with their values, preferences, and priorities. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> the fourth one, CF and transplant teams offer comprehensive, timely, and compassionate end-of-life care, including but not limited to hospice care services to individuals with CF and provide clinical expertise and support through the end of life. <clears throat> CF, and then the fifth one under primary palliative care recommendations is that CF care teams identify and address caregiver concerns and provide support and resources for caregivers outside the CF team. So these five are all focused more towards the CF care teams in the primary care, uh, care recommendations. <clears throat> in the specialty palliative care recommendations, CF and transplant teams should consult specialty palliative care clinical and other specialists to address needs beyond their expertise. <clears throat> and this should be considered when an individual is considering or declines lung transplant. Um, the CF care team partner with palliative care specialists to ensure understanding of CF care and unique needs of individuals with CF. <coughs> I'm sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> and then Finally, I did want to spend a little bit of time on the last two, um, looking at screening and assessment of, of palliative care needs. So the, the foundation recommends that people with CF ages 12 and older um, should annually be given the IPOS, which is the Integrated Palliative Care Outcome Scale, and at disease milestones for unmet palliative care needs. So this is a validated multidimensional measure administered as a self-report tool. Um, it is important that this, if this is given, that a team member reviews with the patient the rationale for giving this questionnaire as well as the plan for reviewing it. It can also, outcomes from this questionnaire can lead to further questionnaires such as the CFQR, PHQ-9, or GAD-7, all which are frequently used in CF care today. Or <clears throat> there's another uh, assessment, the SNAP, the Spiritual Needs Assessment for Patients, which looks at psychosocial, spiritual, existential, or religious needs. So when this IPOS is given, it can, depending on uh, how a patient answers some of the domains, you can then um, <clears throat> give them a, a more specific questionnaire as the ones, the CFQR, PHQ-9, GAD-7, or SNAP, to better assess what they need. <clears throat> For children under 12 years of age, a CF uh, Foundation recommends using the same questionnaire with children and caregivers to guide conversations and identify the needs. The IPOS is validated in adolescent but not children. That's why we're just using this as a guide to, for discussions, using simpler language and open-ended questions. And then similarly for caregivers, it is recommended offering <coughs> caregivers um, annually something called the BASC, which is Brief Assessments um, Score for Caregivers. And this is validated in caregivers of patients receiving palliative care, identifies targets for follow-up and management of caregiver burden. Um, interestingly, also the, the CF guidelines for depression and anxiety recommend offering parents of caregivers of children zero to 17, the PHQ-9 and GAD-7, but with the, the BASC, if it's indicated, you can offer the PHQ-9 and GAD-7 to caregivers with adults, uh, caregivers of adults with CF as well. And then 
Um, screening following the death of an in individual with CF may also allow centers to su support um, bereaved caregivers, and there's a, a assessment called the Prolonged Grief Questionnaire, the PG-13. So in conclusion, uh, palliative care services may and should be employed throughout the disease course from diagnosis to end of life. Broadly, the goals of palliative care are to decrease symptoms and improve quality of life. Training for care teams is needed to provide optimal primary palliative care and to know when to refer. And training for specialized palliative care spe uh, specialists on unique challenges in the CF fibrosis is, in cystic fibrosis is needed. Palliative care has been shown in multiple other disease states to improve quality of life, patient satisfaction, and symptom burden, as well as healthcare utilization. All right. Dr. Bartow, as we wait to load the questions from the audience into the iPad, can you share with us the changes that you have seen regarding end-of-life medications, attitudes, and therapies for the past 10 years in your care? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I think for me, palliative care um, has changed in that starting to discuss uh, end-of-life a little bit sooner than actually um, it's needed. So uh, early on, patients would decline. We would have a, the conversation about transplant. They would either pursue transplant and move on that way, or they would decline transplant, and then we would come up with end-of-life plans. <clears throat> now, especially with the advent of um, the advanced lung disease guidelines, we are starting to initiate conversations much earlier about um, how patients see their future, what their goals are, um, and how, how they envision things progressing, as well as discussing with them what we believe their progression may be. Again, in the advent of, of the modulators, that's, that's a little bit of a moving target, but um, definitely starting to have these conversations a lot earlier, uh, I think, has been the biggest change I've seen. Are there any questions from the audience? You can submit now at the bottom of the app. We'll wait a few minutes. Okay, we have a first one. What's your threshold to transition from providing primary palliative care as a provider to engaging specialized palliative care providers? So that's a great question. <clears throat> There's not um, defined specific triggers. Um, I think if an individual care team member is uncomfortable providing what the patient needs, that's a perfect time to, to refer to a specialized um, provider, as well as if certain symptoms, such as dyspnea, pain, um, are not responding to our initial um, attempts at, at treatment, I think that's an appropriate time. And then, uh, as I said, one example, if there's um, a difference of opinion between family members and, and people with CF about how things should progress, oftentimes it would be important to involve a, a specialized palliative care trained individual to help navigate those discussions. Uh, or just a couple of examples. Okay, here's another question. Do you currently administer any of these questionnaires and who controls that conversation with the family? Uh, uh, that's also a great question. And like I said, there's a lot I learned about doing this talk. Um, so currently, the only questionnaires that we administer are the PHQ-9 and GAD-7. But I think, like I said, the, the recent CF Foundation guidelines um, having uh, delineated the integrated palliative care assessment um, I think is uh, something that we're going to be looking at, and I've already started some conversations with our, with our social worker about how that might happen. I do think that there is gonna have to be some education from care team members to the patient and not just, not just hand them this questionnaire, but uh, explain to them the rationale, whether we sit down and do that or whether there's a cover sheet, and we're, we're still in discussion about how that, that will happen. Okay, thank you. We have a few more questions. Um, how soon, how frequently does someone reach out to a bereaved parent or family member after the passing of a loved one? That's also a really good question. Um, I think a lot of that depends on how your relationship is with that 
a family member, uh, you can reach out to them as soon as uh, attending services to um, a couple of weeks afterwards. Uh, I know that our team will send a, a card after a, a person with CF uh, passes on, um, and that usually ends up going out a couple of weeks after, and it's signed by the whole team so they know that um, we're still thinking of them. Um, <clears throat> those are the, the so typically uh, team members, if able, if it's a um, within our schedule, we're able to attend services. We frequently do, and then the card that goes out a couple weeks later. You mentioned that the CF Foundation recommends care teams receive training in palliative care. Are there recommendations on how centers should pursue this and make it a part of their regular practice? There isn't recommendations on how they pursue this. There are some training modules uh, that are available, um, both uh, in video as well as um, on paper through uh, the Port CF. Um, but there is not, there has been some work on how to create a cur curriculum, but there isn't standardized curriculum at this juncture that's recommended. Okay. Uh, one thing that can be helpful to bring about the concept of palliative care for a specific patient is the CF Foundation guideline on advanced lung disease. Have you started to implement the advanced lung disease guidelines in your clinic? We, we have. We've created an advanced lung disease tracker. Um, so as we have discussions with patients that goes on that tracker, as we identify barriers um, to disease progression and, and transplant referral, and um, we, we, I, we document that. Um, we also, as far as the clinical guidelines for advanced lung disease, that is something that we're still uh, in the process of, of creating as far as how to implement um, echocardiograms and, and certain other tests that, that are uh, appropriate for advanced lung disease. Um, but we are, we are in the process of implementing those and, and determining how to track that, best track them. Okay, last question. Do you find that patient and family's understanding of palliative care versus hospice care a barrier to introduction? Uh, absolutely. Um, I think, in general, I think patients, family members, care team providers, I think uh, understanding the differences between the two is, is very important. And I think the education of each of those groups is going to be imperative in order to be able to make this a successful venture, um, in order to be able to have those discussions about palliative care and not worried that... Um, CF patients are going to have to understand this because they, you don't want them concerned that we're just talking about, you know, how they're going to die. In reality, we're trying to talk about how to better their life. Thank you, Dr. Barto. That was a wonderful uh, explanation of palliative care. Our next, oops, our next speaker. Our next speaker is a CF patient family member from Houston Baylor Clinic. Molly McGee was born and raised in Houston, Texas. She received a Bachelor of Music Education degree with a minor in psychology from Southwestern University. Afterwards, Molly worked as a psychiatric research assistant at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston where she beat her husband Cliff into publication in medical journals, much to his dismay. She then returned to the University of Houston to get her master's in vocal performance. Molly and Cliff moved to Hawaii in 1998, where she performed with the Hawaiian Opera Theater Maisy, Orvis Opera Studio, and other venues. After returning to Houston, she opened a private voice studio in 2002 and has been teaching ever since. During that time, she supported her husband, Cliff McGee, who had cystic fibrosis, multiple other health issues, and finally acute myeloid leukemia. She took care of several family members with cancer and other medical problems until their passing. Many medical professionals would ask if she was a doctor or a nurse. Her husband, Dr. Cliff McGee, would say, 
She's field trained. Please welcome Molly McGee as she shares her experiences. Good afternoon. Uh, I want to start out by saying that um, my name, of course, is Molly McGee, and I have no disclosures. I have no disclosures related to this presentation. Is better. Is that better? Can you hear me now? Excuse us. Okay, how about now? Just need to project. Project. It's okay. Is that okay. Um, is that better in the back now? Okay, good. All right. Um, I'm the window, the widow of a wonderful man, Cliff McGee, who just happened to have CF. We were married 26 years, three months, and three days, and we're best friends for even, lo even longer. And we both grew up in Houston. The first day I met him was at his home with a group of friends. I saw this strange machine, an IPBB, in the room and asked, what is that? Probably not the most apposite question for a first meet and greet. Our, first, our best friend, Pat, answered, it's to help him breathe. I looked at Cliff and jokingly said, what's wrong? Can't you breathe? He responded with a very deadpan face, no, I can't. Well, Pat burst out into laughter while I figuratively spent the rest of the night with the dunce hat on in the corner. <laughs> that was Cliff's sense of humor. Sometimes dry, sometimes goofy, but always quick and witty. He loved making people laugh even when they didn't want to. And from that night on, we were best friends. This is a picture of Cliff as an infant. He was about six months old. He was a very happy baby, always laughing, really. However, this picture, I think, must have been taken when he was diagnosed as a baby, and he was not happy about that. Um, Cliff was 1972 poster child for the Gulf Coast chapter of uh, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. He attended UTMB, University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, for medical school and residency in child and adolescent psychiatry. During this time, we got married two weeks after sinus surgery and in the middle of a four-week break from medical school. After he finished residency, we moved to Hawaii for three and a half years, then back to Houston in 2002, where he was on staff at the Harris Center for Mental Health and Intellectual Development Disorders until he passed. He was honored with the Houston Baptist University Outstanding Alumnus Award and said that it was a privilege to administer to people and be their doctor and this is something that I would never want to take for granted. This was a quality that made him such an inspiration to his friends, his families and patients, coworkers and medical providers. That along with his keen sense of humor and amazing storytelling talent. He was incredibly intelligent and determined, but he was also full of humility, humility compassion and empathy. Cliff fiercely fought and managed his CF and other health conditions and was still able to laugh a lot, tell jokes a lot, and quote the perfect one-liners at the most opportune times. As mentioned earlier, we met as teenagers almost immediately becoming best friends. I loved his parents and sister, their welcoming warm nature, humor, and strong family unity, and the endless supply of candy that his mom always had on hand. Then five years later, Cliff asked me out. Um, our first date consisted of going out to dinner, then coming back to his home where his mom and older sister spent the next three hours interrogating me, much to Cliff's dismay, but in a very comical and sweet way because they wanted to make sure I was good enough for their boy. And I guess I was because we were married within the year. I want to talk about our journey, which led up to the final week of Cliff's life. In many ways, I think I have a unique perspective because Cliff was a doctor 
so he and we experienced this journey from both sides of the aisle. Cliff was very type A about his routine. He never missed a treatment or medication dose. This was an incredible, incredible commitment on his part and for his mom and me as his caretakers to keep medications stocked, setups clean, doctor visits scheduled, and to battle insurance. Any medical team will always tell and encourage patients with CF and their families to live life as normal as possible while still maintaining a rigorous regimen required to stay healthy. The truth is there are many sacrifices that the patient and the family make. CF always took priority. Careers, education, vacations, and day-to-day -day life, social life, were all dictated by routines, treatments, medications, hospital stays, and the uncertainty of frequent sick days. It also makes being prepared for the end of life a pressing and daunting issue, much more so than what our peers experienced. Understanding this and being compassionate through this process is imperative for the healthcare team and providers that treat patients with CF or any chronic illness. As a young couple, we had some pointed conversations that are generally not part of a young relationship. Even before we were married, we talked about a family and the probability that we could not have children. Having a family would impact the time dedicated to Cliff's care and subsequently his health. Early on, we took the typical financial and legal steps that most people take later, a will, DNR, et cetera. We did not spend money with abandon and were always aware that if he became disabled for an extended period of time, it would create a significant financial hardship. Unfortunately, the adage of the struggling musician, riding the coattails of a doctor was not true in our relationship. I'm sure you could figure that one out. Um, because financial security and longevity are not a given for a person with CF. We also had the end of life discussion. It was important, oops. it was important for him, uh, for me to promise that I would let him go when it was time. I think this was not only for his peace of mind, but also a firm foundation for me to stand on when emotionally I might not be in the right place to make this decision alone. Looking forward, I had already promised to put his comfort and quality of life before my emotions when the time was to come. This was also a safeguard for him. Many times as a doctor, he had seen patients change their mind about end of life at the end of life time. This decision can also can often cause undue pain that they would not necessarily want. The change of heart or mind can be out of fear or medical or effective medications like steroids causing labile emotions. It is incredibly difficult, fragile, and a narrow path to navigate for the patient, family, and treatment team. But being prepared, knowing what the patient and family want when not under pressure is important. Any chronic illness will face these issues. CF is unique though from many chronic illnesses. It is all consuming every day and dictates so much of how you live your life. So when the let me go time comes, it can be very difficult, very emotional, and perhaps somewhat more complicated than some palliative care and end of life processes. Having the whole treatment team involved in this path is important to avoid some of the unfortunate situations that took place with Cliff. This is a book written by Jerry Hendon. It's been a good life, Dad. Jerry's son, Kevin, was the same age as Cliff, and coincidentally, Jerry worked at the Exxon building in Houston with Cliff's dad. Kevin passed at 18 years of age. I got a letter from Jerry after Cliff's death. I also got his book, which took him 25 years to write, and I understand why. This is not an easy book to read because I relive Cliff's life with every page that I read. It is an insightful and an intelligent read, though. I can only go through a few pages before I have to put it down because it's too familiar. Walking the halls of the hospital, the daily life of a CF, and the sacrifices. But to understand the impact that CF has on the daily life for the patient and for the family, caretakers, and friends is paramount, especially at the end of life. 
We did not have much of a social life to avoid infection, limiting contact with friends, especially if they, quote, just have a cold, was our norm. Not going, through, not going to movies, plays, symphonies, oftentimes not going out to eat was typical. Social events that many people take for granted were missed. This is a decision on our part to protect Cliff's health. Even a short, simple trip required extra preparation. So knowing these sacrifices that should have happened, what, what should have happened during the final week? Cliff was fighting through the perfect storm. Because he was so immunosuppressed, we both followed intense protocol to avoid contact and infection. When he went to the ER with an intestinal blockage requiring surgery, he wasn't placed in a private room. This should have been standard of care throughout his hospitalization. Pay attention to the chart and the patient's multiple diagnosis, comorbidities, standing plan of care, not just the emergency at hand. Know if there's a DNR on the chart. I do not intend to question the medical decisions made by the doctors during the final week. What I want to address is the attention given to palliative care with the knowledge on hand and the goal of patient comfort. Decisions made by the staff at end of life need to be improved. The anesthesiologist chose to leave Cliff intubated after emergency surgery since he had compromised pulmonary function. However, he was fully awake and aware during this time. He also was put into wrist restraints. I cannot imagine the torture that he was going through during this time. He could not cough, he could not talk, he could not move. He wanted to breathe on his own. And he was also very hot, but he could not communicate. He wanted to be cool with the infection. This is the last note that he wrote. When I spoke with the bedside nurse at 6 a.m. Sunday morning, he asked if I could bring a small fan. I couldn't find one early on a Sunday morning. As far as pulmonary care, there needs to be more attention and action taken for the patient's comfort while intubated. Again, Cliff was fully alert. RT was contacted around 7 a.m. Um, to start the extubating protocol. Hours went by and no one showed up. I was kicked out of the um, ICU at 12 p.m. since there was no visitation between 12 and 2. The surgeon saw me sitting in the waiting room around 1. He was shocked and angry that RT had not shown up. Um, and by this time, I was allowed back at bedside. RT was finally there doing the required test to liberate him from the tubes and wrist restraints. The relief of look on his face is something that I cannot describe. It should not have taken this long, and the excuses proliferated. For two and a half days, Cliff was in a bed in the ward section of the ICU. From the time he was able to talk, he asked why he was not in isolation given his multiple medical conditions and bacteria colonization. This posed a significant threat to himself and other patients. Hospital staff were unaware of this, only that he was recovering from abdominal surgery and that he and his wife had no medical knowledge or experience. Really? Did they bother to notice he was a doctor? <laughs> uh, and also, he had often referred to me as being field trained, so obviously being around him, I had medical proficiency with how to handle him and the equipment. Um, he was not moved until a private room until Tuesday. Furthermore, the ID doctor that was on team was not notified until Monday afternoon, 30 hours after he was in the hospital, admitted to the hospital, and only after repeated requests to, um, ID is infectious disease, and only after repeated requests to contact her. Visitation was another huge, huge issue. The surgical ICU had visitation hours, which they were stringent about. Some nurses were indulgent, but I was kicked out many times. Cliff had been in other ICUs at the same hospital, and they did not have visitation hours. I was allowed to come and go as I needed. We discussed the CQ visitation policy with several staff. Cliff talked to the nursing administration about the policy and lack of flexibility given the, 
his request and prognosis. He recounted his time as a resident on consult and liaison rotation when he was a resident. Children were in the ICU and the parents were not always allowed at bedside. Some of them passed while visitation policies restricted their parents from being there. These family members hated the nurses, they hated the doctors, they hated the staff, they hated the hospital because they could not be with their child during their final minutes. This is unacceptable and something that should not, uh, that should have been at the forefront of palliative and end of life care. Hospital policy should not always dictate patient and family care. The last several hours of Cliff's life showcases how important it is for being prepared and having medical staff understand the patient and the big picture. From Friday forward, Cliff's condition declined rapidly. I'm sure the steroids drove his emotion that week. I hope that elevated ammonia levels kept him from being aware of the imminent situation. I was once again kicked out of the ICU Saturday night at 10 p.m. Within 30 minutes of getting home, the nurse called. She was abrupt and said that they needed to intubate him again to avoid him from going into cardiac arrest. He was unresp unresponsive and had a, a very high respiration rate. She repeated in a loud and demanding voice that I needed to authorize the hospital to put him back on a ventilator or he would die. This included me talking to multiple people to witness this authorization and start the procedure. In the back of my mind, I knew this was wrong. Cliff would not have wanted this. Doctors had cautioned me against this in the past few days and had given his condition a low probability of recovery. He was already eight months into a six to 12 month prognosis of AML, comorbid to CF and his other medical conditions. And yet the screaming nurse on the other end of the phone line convinced me this was necessary. And for what? To live through the night? Go through the necessary procedure of being intubated again with what little lucidity he had? To be tortured again? Was this really necessary? If the medical staff had been fully aware of all of his conditions and bothered to look at the chart, they might have been more inclined to let him go and spare me. The morning that Cliff passed, I arrived at the hospital well before visitation. I hesitated to enter at first, but then walked in. The receptionist was blunt and rude in telling me that I was not, not allowed in at that time. I simply responded that my husband would probably be dead in the next few hours, and she was not going to keep me from being with him. Luckily, security was not called, and they left me alone. There is nothing happy about palliative care and end-of-life care. For the patient and family, it's traumatic and a very sad journey. For the treatment team, it's poignant and often frustrating. But compassion and knowledge is so important. There is very little time by the medical team in an ER or ICU to be fully informed of the patient's history or current prognosis. But with all the chaos that goes on in the hospital, being able to quickly identify patients with a potentially life-ending process is essential. Engaging the treatment team, understanding what's realistic, and having the daily medical staff on board is nearly impossible, but it needs to be improved. There were many things that didn't go smoothly Cliff's last few days. Beyond medical care, palliative care to the patient and the CF includes the understanding. CF has been their life, all consuming for the patient and the family. This is what the family is going to be without, the person and the consuming care. This is the hole, the void, that will end up with the last heartbeat. I would like to end on a positive note, though. There were things that were good, moments filled with compassion and understanding of what can be done to comfort the patient and family. These moments are grounded in knowledge and the patient, uh, grounded in knowledge of the patient and the outcome. The last few days before he passed, his CF doctor, Dr. Bartow, came on her own time to visit. She offered care and insight, compassion, and levity. She sat with us, she visited, she talked about what Cliff meant to her, and this was so special to Cliff, and it's still special to me. 
Being part of a care team when it comes time to address end of life or palliative care means sometimes stepping outside of the box, not only giving medical care that is part of the job description, but these little things are not little. The night that he passed, I came back to the ICU while they were intubating him. I had to wait in the hall until I finished the procedure. A hospital staff member passed by. I don't know who he was or what his job was, but he saw me standing in the hall, upset and alone. He asked if I would like for him to pray with me, and we prayed, and it gave me comfort. Finally, the next morning, before the final extubation, staff moved Cliff over in the bed so that I could lie behind, beside him. His heart beat so loud, and it seemed to keep going, until I realized it was my heart, not his. His body was gone, but I will always know that I was there <laughs> beside him until his last breath and his last heartbeat. So if there is one common thread through the positive events of Cliff's final week, it would be compassion. The things that I hold dear are ones that are grounded in compassion. Likewise, if there is one thread through the medical care that was less than ideal, it would come from lack of knowledge about the patient's medical condition and prognosis. Staff just going through the motions, not paying attention, ignoring the patient's comfort, or weighing in on a prognosis. Palliative and end-of-life care should be approached to comfort and ease the suffering of the patient and the family as much as possible, and sometimes outside of the policy. Thank you. Molly, that was tremendous. Thank you for sharing Cliff's life with us and his death. He was a phenomenal physician. While the audience puts in their questions, can you answer and tell us what type of patients did Cliff work with every day? Um, Cliff was a child and adolescent psychiatrist. He did work with some adults, but his primary patient care was towards um, children um, age 3 to 17, uh, many of them with bipolar, schizophrenia, severe ADHD, autism, many of them having significant PTSD due to severe trauma or abuse. Um, and he had a special connection with these patients because in many ways he, he understood abuse and PTSD. And he was very well loved and liked by the patients and their families because of his compassion. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience? Please enter it now at the bottom of the app. Thank you very much, Molly. Thank you. Our next team is a fantastic physical therapy duo from the hometown of Philadelphia. Please welcome Jackie and Leanne as they co-lecture on this very important aspect of CF care. Jackie graduated from Utica University in 2009 with a bachelor's in health sciences and 2011 as a doctor of physical therapy. She began her career in Florida, but shortly moved to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 2013 to pursue her dream career of working with pediatrics at Children's Hospital at Philadelphia. Jackie was given the opportunity to start specializing in the pulmonary population, not knowing she would soon fall in love with her patients and her families, dedicate her practice to improving their well-being through exercise, airway clearance, and good old fun. Jackie has taught at local universities, has been a teaching assistant for Mary Mastery's course, If You Can't Breathe, You Can't Function, and has presented at the NACFC over the past few years. Jackie hopes to learn and lead through her practice for many years to come. 
And to introduce my co-presenter, Leanne Meyer is a physical therapist at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She graduated with a BS in kinesiology from Temple University in 2013 and attained her doctorate of physical therapy degree from George Washington University in 2016. She has been working in acute care at CHOP since 2016 and works primarily with the pulmonary population. She has a strong interest in treating patients with cystic fibrosis and patients who are pre and post lung transplant. In her spare time, she enjoys running, reading books, and spending time with her family, especially her dog, Ruthie. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our talk on the pediatric physical therapy role in end-stage cystic fibrosis, what to prioritize. I'm Jackie. I'm Leanne. And we are physical therapists at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, I know we're about halfway or a little over halfway through the conference, but as the home team, on behalf of myself and Leanne, our CF and lung transplant team, the undefeated Eagles, and the future world series, actually no, I don't want to jinx it, but who doesn't love a good comeback story, right? Um, we wanted to give you a warm welcome to Philadelphia. And on to the real talk, by show of hands, who has had their Philly cheesesteaks already? Not bad. I see two hands over there. Okay, well, if you haven't had it yet or you decide to get seconds, my recommendation is adding hot peppers if you like a little bit of spice and dipping it in ketchup if you like a little zing. I know I was a little apprehensive at first, but if you're a dipping kind of person, I promise you it might be a game changer. We have no relationships to disclose during this presentation. And this afternoon, we're going to discuss the physical therapy role in discussing palliative needs in the acute care setting. We wanna talk about the prioritization of interventions when a patient is hospitalized for a prolonged time in the ICU. We wanna talk about the coordination and communication needed when working with medically complex patients, which would include tracheostomy, ECMO, and intubation, and to identify emotional and psychosocial barriers that a patient and family may have and how it can affect our plan of care. So as we've been talking over the past few conferences and certainly throughout this one, the CF disease is slowly but surely becoming something that we hopefully just read in our medical textbooks. That's thanks to the advances in medicine, technology, and the countless amount of people dedicating their lives to finding our cure. Looking at the CFF registry highlights from 2021, you can see that survival rate is increasing, lung function is improving, and the overall need for lung transplant is on, on the downtrend for all ages. Unfortunately, progress is never as fast as we want it and we'll still be faced with those patients who still have to manage end-stage cystic fibrosis. According to Cavalierados et al., 6% of individuals with CF will still need a lung transplant in the next 20 years. Um, just to recap on palliative care, just in case you uh, missed Dr. Bartos' talk, who was our first speaker, just because you were walking 15 miles from, from the plenary. <laughs> um, the CF Foundation put out this great article on the models of palliative care when caring for those with cystic fibrosis. This is an approach that we should all consider taking, even from day one of diagnosis. There's this common misconception between hospice care and palliative care. Palliative care is meant to be introduced and help manage the disease throughout the whole entire lifespan, where hospice care is initiated at the end of life. The term palliative care, honestly, has really gotten a bad rap over all, over all these years, because majority of families immediately think end of life when a team brings up palliative care. And then they often refuse these services due to fear and misunderstanding. Now the intensity of palliative care can vary by patient and it should match the patient and family's palliative needs. This article defines palliative care into two types. You have your primary palliative care, which is where you'd categorize your cystic fibrosis team, which includes your PTs, your RTs, um, other supporting roles. Think of it as your patient's first line of defense. Then you have your specialty palliative care, which is a separate team of specialty trained palliative care specialists who support the CF care team when there's complex or more severe concerns. Us, as in the primary palliative care team, or the PPC team for short, are responsible for 
four domains of care. These four domains are symptom management, communication and advanced care planning, caregiver support, and care coordination. I should mention that at CHOP, physical therapy is fortunate to be part of the pre-transplant evaluation, and then we get to follow these kiddos long term. We have seen a wide range of ages for those being evaluated for transplant, but for CF specifically, we've seen as early as about six to seven years old. It is often that our patients get to a point where they're just too medically complex to be at home and need to be hospitalized while waiting for their transplant, which puts us as physical therapists as key role, as a, in a key role as a PPCT member when managing their care. So when thinking about those four domains, we help with symptom management as it directly affects our physical therapy sessions. We become part of the conversation about addressing the patient's and family's goals in care planning. We provide caregiver and patient support as we oftentimes become an emotional sounding board when treating a patient for 30 to 45 minutes at a minimum and asking them to do difficult exercises and tasks. And then we participate in care coordination, whether it be the day-to-day -day need of setting up a successful, a successful physical therapy session or just the overall conversation of determining if the patient is an appropriate transplant candidate based on their success of rehab while waiting for transplant and what their success will look like post-transplant. While we think about all these things, we have to consider that these patients may be on the wait list for a year or more depending on their size, blood type, and time on the list, compared to our adults where the turnaround time can be as fast as a few weeks. And even more importantly, having this awareness that they may not even survive lung transplant or may not even survive the surgery itself. Um, I'm sorry, survive to lung transplant or not, or not survive the surgery itself. So with all these things in the back of our mind, our PT approach begins to change. So for our patients with end-stage cystic fibrosis awaiting lung transplant, these are some of the goals we're going to focus on from a PT standpoint. So exercise training being probably our biggest area as PTs, with this population, we're really going to emphasize endurance training, strengthening, especially core and lower extremity strengthening, respiratory muscle training, posture and flexibility, and gross motor skill development if age appropriate. At our center, we have a general rule of thumb that patients should be able to walk 150 feet in order to remain eligible for lung transplant. While this is not a hard and fast rule and there are exceptions made, this is something we're keeping in mind when we're deciding what our interventions are going to be. We also want to make sure we're considering our role in psychosocial and behavioral interventions. Um, so this could be collaborating with child life and psychology uh, to incorporate some relaxation strategies or coping techniques. We should re recognize that we are a frequent presence in these patients' lives. And we can help implement these strategies that might help them be more successful in their overall care. Another major area of ours is education. We'll educate on airway clearance techniques, breathing strategies, energy conservation tactics, pre-transplant expectation and plan of care, and post-transplant ex expectation. And then we are periodically implementing outcomes assessments. So every patient that comes in for a pre-transplant evaluation will get a six-minute walk test as part of their PT evaluation as well as strength measurements, range of motion, and trunk mobility measurements. We, as a hospital, have been utilizing the one-minute sit-to-stand in this population, as well as a pediatric frailty scale that we've adapted from adult frailty scales. This is not something that's validated, but just something we've been using to compare the patient to themselves to help monitor how they're progressing or regressing. And then we always want to make sure we're taking into consideration the patient and family's goals. So the CF Foundation recommends that CF and transplant care teams engage our patients and families in goals of care and advanced care planning across the lifespan to align our care with their values, preferences, and priorities. As CF care team members, we often develop strong relationships with these patients and can be ideally suited to be their first line monitors of their palliative care needs. Lung transplant is a last option for these patients, so we should always keep in mind that they have the ultimate decision as to whether or not to pursue lung transplant. We pulled this 
chart from Wickerson et al., an article on rehabilitation in lung transplant. I highlighted the areas which for this presentation are pre-transplant oh. <laughs> in the inpatient setting. Um, so in the article, they point out that while there are no studies on pediatric lung transplant and rehabilitation, clinical experience indicates that it can be of significant benefit for these patients to help prevent deterioration in function. So we want to incorporate those exercise training strategies talked about, but we may need to modify based on their medical status. So there are some things to keep in consideration when we're deciding what to prioritize for these patients. As Jackie mentioned, they can be waiting a really long time for a lung transplant, and we tend to see a decline in function over this time. But we know that exercise capacity is a major predictor of weightless survival. So we might have a patient who has depression and is having significant pain with movement and really doesn't want to participate in PT. And we want to be empathetic toward them, but we also know that they'll have improved outcomes with an ability to walk a longer distance. So we need to figure out how to implement treatment strategies that will allow them to have successful transplant and recovery while also acknowledging their current struggles and symptoms. Many of these patients will end up needing a bridge to transplant, which can be ECMO and or mechanical ventilation. These are life-saving, but can lead to significant deconditioning, which may limit their ability to ultimately stay in that rehabable state. So it's really important that we mobilize as quickly as possible. This requires a lot of care and communication, which we'll talk more about on the next slide. We also see many reports of symptom and symptoms, such as dyspnea, air hunger, and pain. And this can also really hinder their ability to participate in PT. So I often find that my focus shifts to symptom management as interventions to even get these kids to a spot where they're able to participate in those exercise training interventions. And then we're constantly assessing their rehab potential. So we keep open communication with our transplant team as well as CT surgery and address any rehab related concerns as they occur. So really, we're constantly assessing how we need to adapt our interventions based on the patient's medical status and complexities, and are trying to align our ultimate goal of maintaining or improving exercise capacity and having them participate in exercise training with where they are from a medical and psychosocial standpoint. So we know what interventions we want to implement, and we recognize that there are many factors to take into consideration when deciding what we can prioritize. And efficient care and communication is essential to be able to give these patients the best care. So we need to make sure we're identifying our goals, both with the therapy and medical teams in the session to make sure we're safely mobilizing. This is especially important when we're talking about a patient on ECMO mobility. And then also with the patient and family throughout their course of care, both on a day-to-day -day basis to hopefully have improved buy-in with our treatment, as well as carryover of our recommendations outside of therapy as well as throughout their course, and if the patient and family do ultimately decide to move away from lung transplant, we're having a discussion on what our role can be and what interventions we can provide. We need to make sure we're establishing a clear communication of activity orders. So if our patient ends up with a tracheostomy, typical hospital protocol would be that we'd wait one week until they get their first trach change. But because it's so important that these patients are moving as quickly as possible, We'll have discussions on whether they're appropriate to mobilize prior to that first trach change or if they're a candidate to have their trach change moved up earlier. So keeping open communication with all of their medical teams. If our patient goes up on ECMO, we're making sure that everybody is on board for doing ECMO mobility. This is when we'll especially develop a relationship with our ECMO specialist as they're gonna be the showrunner watching the circuit, letting us know if we need to reassess how and when we're moving. And then establishing vital sign parameters, especially for heart rate, oxygen, and vent settings. Um, in my experience, the medical team tends to be pretty liberal with these settings since it is so important that these kids get up and mobilize, but they are at an increased risk of medical complications, and especially our patients up on ECMO who are at an increased risk of stroke. So we want to make sure we're moving as safely as possible. One of the things that can make us be most successful is optimizing the timing of our sessions. So as PTs in acute care, we have a lot of patients to see in one day and only so much time to see them. And these patients in particular tend to take up a lot of our time. So making sure that we've got everybody involved and going to be ready at the right time. So reaching out to respiratory, occupational therapy, nursing, ECMO specialist. 
Ideally, we'll create a schedule for these patients and all their medical care and baths can be timed around our sessions. We wanna make sure we are recognizing if they need a certain level of respiratory support for our session. So if our patient's on BiPAP, but they're sprinting to nasal cannula for a couple hours during the day, but we recognize that they really need that pressure support to be able to participate, that we're timing our session so we can see them when they're on BiPAP. If pain is a significant factor, that they've already got their pain meds on board, ready to go by the time we get there. And then something that can make us really successful is having the patient and family involved and having them tasked with being ready for therapy. So they're dressed, their socks are on, they're already out of bed before we even get there. And then make sure, making sure to recognize the other players that can help support our PT goals. So this might look like a co-treat with psychology or child life to help get improved buy-in during the session from the patient or a debrief afterwards with them and figuring out what other strategies we can implement. Uh, having communication with our PAC team, which is the Pediatric Advanced Care Team, and they're one of those specialty palliative care teams. Um, and they are just routinely consulted for our patients with lung transplant. And then if pain continues to be a significant barrier, reaching back out to the pain team and seeing if there are any other strategies we can implement. Um, so going through, wow, that's better, isn't it? Okay, so going through the research, uh, we came across this uh, quote by Choi et al. who says, pediatric patients have additional issues related to development, growth, and education. Therefore, rehab strategies for pediatric patients, pre-lung and post-lung transplant should be comprehensive and modified to differ from programs used in adults. So in short, kids are just not tiny adults, right? with the biggest emphasis on understanding where the patient is developmentally. I'd be hard pressed to believe that our eight-year-old patient was fully aware of the urgency of needing to participate in physical therapy every day when she felt awful while waiting for her lung transplant. Other than trying to get them to participate, the second hardest thing is to educate them on the why we're coming. It's not black and white, and we really look to the caregiver and families to guide us in how aggressive our therapy approach is going to be. We're always faced with this question of, do we motivate to move or do we focus on comfort? We can find ourselves struggling to find this balance of aggressive encouragement, but with, the, but with empathy and compassion. Some days, you want to, some days you feel like you want to be more aggressive, get them to do all these exercises, get them to do all these tasks. And other days you just wish you could let them stay in bed like they're asking you to, hold their hand and tell them everything's going to be okay. Not only do we have to manage the, emotion, the emotional and psychosocial burden of the patient and the family, but you have to realize the effects that it can take on the bedside staff and the medical team as we've been taking care of this patient for days, on weeks, on months. Um, you can often be caught in compassion fatigue where you care so deeply for these patients that you literally become fatigued from trying so hard to provide the best care, but also knowing what potential outcomes the patient may be facing as the days go on. So being part of the PPC team, it can certainly be hard, but it's equally rewarding as you get to help manage your patient's care through all of these scenarios, knowing that you are helping the patient to the best of your ability, but also keeping your patient and their family's goals as the priority. It, you know, I really think it's hard to learn a lot of this through textbook and a lot of it is gonna come through experiences, but as a starting point, I do encourage all of you to take a look at that palliative care uh, article put out by the CF Foundation. Uh, you can actually find it on the CFF website. It's a well-illustrated guideline that provides recommendations to help reduce the physical and emotional symptoms, but also improving the quality of life for people with cystic fibrosis throughout their life. Thank you. Here's our references, questions and answers. And we will take some questions now, if you put those in the app. Thank you. All right, first question. How often do you mobilize before the first trach change? 
after the first week? Or how often do you move, have them move up the first trach change? Let's see if I said that right. So our, the hospital protocol is that um, it's typically seven days that they would have their first trach change. Um, so with these patients, our lung transplant team is really good about being very involved with also their critical care team at this point and having these discussions as well as with ENT. So I would say that for most of our lung transplant kiddos, um, especially those who are, if we're talking about like up on ECMO and wouldn't be otherwise mobilizing, they typically do move it up. They have been, ENT has been moving it to like three or four days, which is what usually happens. We have had cases where we've mobilized before that first trig change um, and consider it progressive mobility. So we have RT there managing um, their trach at that time. Okay, another question. Do you have the capability to ambulate ECMO patients? Yes, we do. Our lung, <laughs> our, our, one of our lovely ECMO specialists is going to talk next and probably talk more about that. But yes, that is one of um, <laughs> our biggest issues with these kids who need lung transplant. We need to get them up as soon as possible. So we will ambulate on ECMO, especially with our CF kids who are on isolation precautions. We are fortunate enough to have a handful of treadmills and ICU tremors that can be moved right to the bedside. So we typically start with that, but getting up next to the bed so the circuit's right there and everything else is right there. Um, but we can also mobilize in the hallway if, if we wanted to. Next question. What are the vital signs, limits, or vent settings, limits that would prohibit mobility at your center? Yeah, so I did mention that they're typically pretty liberal with them if it's a kid who would otherwise not be mobilizing. So if we are talking about that patient on ECMO mobility, and I don't want to step on Sue's toes if she has info on this, um, but we typically it's just, if something's going on with say the circuit or they're having concerns for heart rate or something like that, it'll just be a discussion with the team about what we want to do. So it is case by case specific. It's not like we have a certain number that we're in general watching. Okay, thank you, Jackie and Leanne. That was tremendous. Good insight into exercise. All right. Last but not least, can you guys hear me? Where's our guy? What would we do without IT these days, you guys? Thank you for your patience. Okay. Oh, there you go. Thank you, Jay. Can go back to the screen. All right, last but not least, we have Suzanne Williams. Um, she is the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia's ECMO Center Clinical Specialist and ECMO Manual Coordinator. She earned an MSN in Innovation and Intra and Entre Entrepreneurship Advanced Practice Nursing with a Graduate Certificate in Complementary Integrative Therapies from Drexel University in 2017. Sue is a seasoned expert ICU nurse with a passion for ECMO innovation. Her more than three decades of intensive care nursing experience began in the NICU at CHOP in 1987, and she was involved with inception of ECMO at CHOP in 1990. Her role of ECMO Center Clinical Specialist includes multidisciplinary education, ECMO Specialist Competency Education, Interprofessional Simulation Development and Facilitation, Hospital Policy and Procedure Development, Equipment Ordering and Inventory, and Hi guys, 
difficulties up here getting the PowerPoint to actually upload. It froze. So um, stay tuned. Hang on a sec. I've got some pretty cool video for you, too. So I'm really hoping that you... I'm really hoping that you can hang around and see it. It's there I am. Okay, good news. I think it's going to upload. <laughs> Perfect. Did it work? Yes. Okay, thank you. So hello, and thank you for inviting me to speak today about pediatric ECMO mobility, bridge to transplant, organ donation, or palliative care. Should I put this one down and just use this one? Probably, right? I have nothing to disclose, and I've been granted permission to share the videos and photos today. I would also like to give a shout out to my PT and OT colleagues for all of their help with developing progressive mobility program at our for our pediatric patients at CHOP. Today, I would like to review the process of ECMO mobility program success. This includes discussions surrounding stakeholders, bias, and planning. Then I would like to redirect this talk and discuss how ECMO mobility transitioned from intra-hospital transports and the subject of organ donation versus palliative care and end-of-life care for the pediatric ECMO patient. Let's begin by reviewing strategic planning and procedure development for ECMO mobility. The photo on your, on your right demonstrates that it takes a village to successfully mobilize a patient on ECMO life support. This is Tia, a nine-year-old end-stage CF patient that required ECMO mobility to rehabilitate her in an effort to keep her body and muscles reconditioned while waiting for a lung transplant. As many of you know, Pediatric lungs are not readily available. But let's back up to how we safely developed a progressive mobility program at CHOP. It begins with optimal trust among a team of interdisciplinary colleagues with a shared goal using collaboration and best practices to manage risk and recognize personal bias. Personal bias is synonymous with fear. Personal bias also is synonymous with being human. Every caregiver of ECMO patients fears that without ECMO, the alternative is most likely death. I personally feel that caregiver bias of disrupting ECMO flow is the reason these patients are often oversedated and often not repositioned or moved enough. But that's a topic for another day. ECMO stands for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. It is a mode of therapy that requires cannulation and life support equipment that provides heart and or lung rest for typically reversible conditions. But today we're going to discuss ECMO for potential organ transplant, like our CF patient Tia, waiting for her lungs. ECMO mobility requires interprofessional collaboration with key stakeholders with multiple staff roles, including physicians, nurses, ECMO specialists, respiratory therapists, physical therapists, and occupational therapists. Before every mobilization of an ECMO patient, a risk-benefit discussion is addressed because these children on ECMO support have good days and they have bad days. The parents will tell you it's a daily hospital roller coaster ride. I always mention that ECMO is a marathon, not a sprint. We developed safety checklist to clarify roles and responsibilities during ECMO mobility. These checklists are helpful only if they are easily accessible to bedside staff. So publishing them with your institutional internet policy manual and then making them searchable is very beneficial. We learned that using the minimal amount of people to safely mobilize an ECMO patient, limited confusion, and clear transparent communication was imperative. Our transports are customized, planned events with a huddle, a timeout, and a debrief every time. Clarifying a plan augments a safe experience. This is our CHOP checklist. The team huddle establishes roles and keeps everyone on the same page. 
full battery for the ECMO life support system and having emergency hand crank available are safety nets. Moving IV pumps to the circuit or bed decreases unnecessarily extra poles to navigate through the hallways. We always use a transport monitor to, for vital signs on the go. ECMO heater and sweep gas transition from wall to portable O2 tanks makes us mobile. Moving slowly and deliberately and always being prepared to stop quickly is key for safety. Again, I would like to call out personal bias fears. A healthy fear of accidental malposition of the ECMO cannulas providing life support during moving the ECMO patient is a real possibility. After all, in children, the arterial cannula is only two to four centimeters deep in the aorta, and the venous cannula is seven to 11 centimeters deep in the inferior vena cava. But it's possible to safely secure these cannulas and move ECMO patients. Do not allow your personal bias to paralyze you. Acknowledge it so you can overcome it. Was 10 year old Reuben, who was cannulated onto ECMO for ARDS and persistent air leak syndrome. We lightened his sedation after several days, when he, and when he woke up, he refused to use the bedpan. So we expedited his ECMO mobility so we could, we could put him on the commode. Remember that? <laughs> Personal goals. Once he was comfortable with that maneuver, he began asking to walk, to play basketball and ride a bike, ride a bike on ECMO. Ruben mobilized on ECMO intubated. Kids are so resilient and their determination never falters. But not all ECMO patients are as fortunate to recover. Sometimes we need to use our ECMO mobility intra-hospital transport skills to transport our patients down the hallway to the operating room for organ donation. On the left is a picture of the honor walk thank you. This is 13-year-old Ava. She donated her kids, her kidneys, skin, and corneas. The picture on the right is a simulation of palliative care that moved to end-of-life care for a neonate, neonate who did not survive ECMO. Our ECMO team has the responsibility of looping the cannulas to make it easier for the parents to hold their infant during his final moments. Moral distress is a topic that deserves discussion. At CHOP, we have a forum to debrief all ECMO mortality cases. It's helpful to provide timely, factual case reviews with the staff who are directly involved with these cases. Pediatric ECMO cases are all custom and demonstrate grit by the staff, the families, and the kids themselves. The debriefings discuss lessons learned, and reflect on what went well and how to improve what didn't. It's very important to provide a protected environment to allow staff to grieve and feel supported by the institution. Always highlight the good. It's always tough to deal with the death of a child. Lessons learned. Communication breakdown can derail ECMO mobility, organ donation, and palliative care efforts. Collaborate with the intra-professional stakeholders to get buy-in to innovate. Plan, share the plan, and provide consistent messaging to staff and families. The entire team must have a voice to share any concerns. 
practice, practice, practice. Safety, safety, safety. Debrief and support each other. Squash personal bias because anything really is possible. Questions? Thank you and go Eagles and Phillies. <laughs> Please submit your, your questions with the app. All right, first question. What is the average length of ECMO mobility per session? Well, that is definitely variable, and it is called progressive mobility for that reason in general. We start by just being able to see if they'll tolerate sitting up more than 30 degrees in their bed. And then we move the bed up a little higher and we may put it into chair position. We may then, in the next, over the next several days, get them to dangle their legs over the side of the bed. And then our PT and OT colleagues are phenomenal, truly, I'm not just saying that, <laughs> in bringing devices to the bedside, stools, um, treadmills, all kinds of things to try and encourage them and, and support them when they're trying to bear weight on their, on their legs. Um, every child that goes on to ECMO may go on at different stages of their pathology. So it's so customized and so variable. It can be a week, it could be three days, it could be two weeks, but um, it's a, just a huge collaboration and organization among a whole bunch of different disciplines. Do certain cannula positions prohibit ECMO mobility? Excellent question. If you would have asked me that several years ago, they would have said, or we would have said, we prefer <laughs> VV ECMO, the one single lumen, double lumen, or the one double lumen cannula that goes deeper into the IVC, rather than the two cannulas for VA ECMO. Um, and that's simply because it's a deeper cannula, because the aortic cannula, the arterial cannula just goes into the aorta, so they're always worried about that dislodging. But the truth of the matter is, is if they're sutured well, if they're protected with dressings, and then we do a head wrap, right? We've developed or sort of innovated and had a wrap around their head, so we loop the cannulas up and wrap it around their head. Um, we retape endotracheal tubes when they're not trached. Um, if we can extubate them prior to mobilization, then that's a wonderful thing. But again, it's all disease progression dependent. Do you co-treat your ECMO patients and how long is a typical session? Say it again. Do you co-treat your ECMO patients and how long is a typical session? So coaching ECMO patients, that's... Co-treat. Co-treat, like a... You mean like OTPT? OTPT? Oh, thank you. <laughs> so that would be a much better question for you, my dear. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oftentimes, yes. Um, you know, they're coming from a place of severe deconditioning. Um, except your guy here in the video was very impressive. Um, <laughs> he was determined. Yeah. But oftentimes, it does take a lot of handling. So, um, you know, PT is often the one like helping with the balance and and support while OT is kind of facilitating like the other activities. Um, you know, we obviously can get, hopefully always want to get to a point where we can do this twice a day, just because it's gonna help them having, you know, two a days. Um, but between the coordination and just where they are medically, they just don't often tolerate two separate therapy sessions. Yeah, so it is individual dependent on their attitude and on how they're, if they're in pain or if they're, how their sleep really went the night before. We do try to encourage moving to a bedside that has a Hoyer lift because it helps with the staff in moving these children, especially when they're so deconditioned that they just don't have the strength to sit themselves up in bed. So there's a lot of effort into the progression to be able to get them to stand. But kids are amazing. If they want to do something, they will, <laughs> <laughs> clearly. Ruben will show you. All right, we'll end with one more question. Is it a special ECMO machine or all machines are able to be mobile? We have all of our ECMO machines at CHOP. We have two different systems. We have a cardio help system, which is a smaller transport system. 
Um, optimally, we like to use that because that's the one you saw in the video because it sort of sits on a walker and it's easy to move. But we have moved many children with the roller circuit, which is a bigger footprint and takes another team member to push the actual equipment behind. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. Thank you. Cool. Nice